All right, so this is the longest semi-precious gems ever. If you get bored, just wave and I'll stop. Um, I made any guff, I work at Igo Digital. Um, I'll watch you. Um, I've been doing Ruby for a while. Uh, there's the slides, there's the gem, and there's the documentation, such as it is. So, why do we need a new AWS gem? Uh, we don't. It, right, <laughs> AWS is fine. It worked yesterday, it'll work tomorrow. Is that, if you're using AWS, is everybody pretty much using right AWS for everything? Probably, okay. Um, because they both just access the API, right AWS isn't gonna break. Amazon's not trying to drive them out of business because, I mean, it's a free gem, so why, why would they? Um, but you should use this because it's newer. So that's, that seems like a good reason. Uh, if I don't seem as angry as I usually am, uh, it's because it works pretty well. Um, but things I don't like, the documentation is not great, although this has been updated a lot in the last month or so, and it's getting better all the time. It'll actually be pretty good pretty soon. Um, don't go to the forums on Amazon's website. They have like the developer center. The forums are two pages. The search barely works. There's basically no discussion of anything people are actually doing. Just, just don't, don't bother. Get into the DRB chat channel. There are more people using the gym in there that are smart than there are on the forums. Um, you can always go look at the source code, which is nice. I spent a lot of time in the source today. Uh, the only problem with that is their commits is like one commit per release. Each commit is 10,000 changes, so somebody's being a little trigger happy with rebase in there, and I wish they'd cut it out. I mean, total, the repository is like nine commits. It's easy to read, but uh, it's hard to figure out when something happened. Um, and he, the gem itself, there's some parts you'll see when we get into the code that are very, very raw, but if you've used AWS for anything, the whole Everything in AWS is very raw. There's a lot of power there, but it's also dangerous. Thanks, please. So what does it do? It does all of these. And I have slides for all these, so we can just skip this. You don't have to read them. So managing instances uh, with the gem. I just got, for all the different facets of the gem, I just got a little bit of code. I'm going to skim the surface of each one, because otherwise we would be here until Saturday. Um, you want to start instances? It's real easy. Go get your images. We want to specify more stuff. In this case, I need a couple of EBS volumes because I'm going to put a database on here. I can do that. This will start three servers of my fictional. I don't even know what the tuple number for 16 is, but it's a lot of memory. Um, pretty straightforward. There are 20 more options that you can pass to really tune it up. If you use the command line tool, then you probably already know what they all look like. Um, but it seems pretty straightforward. So if you're using Elastic Load Balancer, which we are, we have a couple of them, uh, it's also really easy. After you've brought your instances up with Ruby, you can then create a load balancer if you need to, and more likely you can register your instances, you can check the health of your instances in the load balancer, and it's all real nice. Um, it's all very lazy, so you can call things and you know, the, the gem itself is built so that things don't actually get requested until you need them, but Amazon also performance can be, let's say, variable. So if you're really relying on this to return quickly, then you're, why would you do that to Amazon? Next, please. Uh, I didn't need access management. If you really want to manage your AWS users programmatically, you can do that. Um, creating users, setting passwords, that's all, so Joel already covered that. Um, Amazon policies though are, there's no documentation about that that's worth a damn. Um, you can go find some XML documentation that probably maps to hashes. There's some JSON stuff, it's, it's bad, but you can make the policies, if you understand how Amazon policy documents work, you can really get, get an awful lot of control um, over how your users interact and what they're allowed to do. Probably especially useful, and there's some other stuff later, that's especially for people who are reselling uh, some piece of Amazon as a service, the, the Herokus and the engine yards of the world. Um, 
where they can control their customers' access to the secret resources underneath. Um, but it gets complicated. There's also user groups, which we don't have anything about up there. Next, please. So there's an object relational mapper, which is built on SimpleDB, which is not relational in any way. There are no joins. I don't understand why they call it an ORM. But there's an object mapper, um, which looks real similar to other things that you've used. Um, I have a capital letter there. That's nice. Um, so creating a product works exactly like every other ORM that's ever been built in the history of the universe. If you don't know this, you, I don't know, you're probably not a programmer. Um, yeah, it's very straightforward. In a second, we're going to look at the way to interact with things using SimpleDB, and this definitely makes a lot more sense to people that have been writing Rails code than trying to do it the SimpleDB way, because the SimpleDB way is a little more complicated. That's please. So um, it's also got validation, which has most of the validation that you're used to from using Active Model. Um, Nothing more to say there. Um, you also have finders, but you have to be careful. There are no joins. The good news is everything's lazy, so you don't have to worry about writing a query that's going to return 10 million documents. You'll get them a little bit at a time, and there are ways to specify what a little bit is. But, um, wow, I'm running around again. That's the end of that line. Don't worry. It's just a closing paren, and then that's it. Um, so you can do reasonably complex queries, but I mean, it doesn't get much more complex than that. Um, oh, yeah, there it is. So it's if you're using any kind of uh, NoSQL <coughs> system, then these limitations look very comfortable. If you're not, then these limitations make you remember why you don't use a NoSQL system. Um, and that's the, any questions on the mapper? I guess let's pause on the mapper. Okay. So far, all good. I know I'm going like a thousand miles an hour here, but you know. All right, good. Let's look at cats. So S3, which is probably this is where we use um, right AWS more than anything. I mean, it's the most common thing that we do to interact with Amazon services and code. Um, and creating S3 works just like you'd hope it would. You create a bucket. You can um, look at this. This doesn't actually pull your objects. It just pulls metadata, which seems reasonable, but it's nice. Um, if you want to add something, you just load the one of the few pictures of cats that you have on your computer. Um, you know, it's real easy. It all works like normal Ruby to get things to and from S3. Um, now around this, there's also pretty rich classes and methods for doing authentication, managing your buckets, looking at you know, the age of things, all the metadata properties, all the things that you need to do to make S3 work correctly, it's all there. But if you really just want to put files in it, that's it. It's that easy. Next, please. So if you don't want to use the their object relational mapper, um, you can do this. Um, this is writing sort of directly against um, the, the underlying uh, SimpleDB interface, um, which again works like things that are already out there, but it's it's pretty simple. Um, you know, you create your domain, which is like a table. You can add whatever attributes you want to them. Um, you don't save with this when you add attributes. Those attributes are immediately sent to the database. Um, so that can be good or can be bad. Uh, there's probably a way to change that if you want, but I didn't dig into it too deeply, honestly, because by this point I was like, man, how many more of these pieces are there? Um, but it's not hard to use this interface if you don't want to use the, the mapper for some reason. Next, please. So simple email service. Is anybody actually using this? Excellent. So yeah, we are using that. <laughs> It's kind of important, actually. Yes. Okay, well, um, <laughs> easy to set up uh, if you want to use Action Mailer and it works. Um, if you want to send email, you know, when you need to send, send email directly, you just, it works like most other email systems that you've used. Um, it really does hide. Once you 
pass your magic keys into Amazon, it hides most of the heavy lifting. Um, it just gives you the interfaces that you're used to. Um, simple email service is one of the few that doesn't have a lot of extra stuff in that part of the gym. Pretty much it's sending email, verifying email, and then you know tracking kind of what happens with your email, but it is one of the easier to read portions of the source code. Next please. So uh, SNS, which is one of the really cool services that not enough people know about, but it's neat. Um, it allows you to create uh, alerts uh, and then subscribe to those alerts. So, for instance, when a server goes down, I could programmatically I've subscribed myself to this server alert alert, and then you can publish. And any anybody that's subscribed to that then gets that notification. And you can subscribe with uh, email, uh, some HTTP that you're supposed to get. Um, there's there's a whole list of different things you can have it push something into the queue automatically. There's, there are a lot of things that on the, the, the other end of, of SNS, after you've pushed a message into, then that gets broadcast out without you having to worry about and manage that list of 20 different people via three different methods and, and all that. So, um, pretty simple, really. <coughs> and this is something that, it, it's a good tool to have in your toolbox if you're doing other things at Amazon. Um, SQS, the Q service, which is the one part that I actually know, so I'm going to slow down a little bit. Everybody good with what we talked about so far? I'm still going talking really fast. Okay, so um, SQS lets you queue up strings and then go get those strings later. Fortunately, we, we can work with that. Um, depending on which documentation you look at, there's an 8K or a 64K limit. Those numbers are kind of interchangeable. Uh, it's an option you can select in the interface, but they don't actually say that anywhere. So it's one of those two limits, trust me. Um, when you're writing it, you need to be aware your messages will show up late. It may take a minute or two for your messages to get there. Uh, you will receive messages multiple times. In the construction of Q distributed queue systems, like it's just, it's one of those things that's gonna happen. You, you can build a system that will either lose messages or send messages multiple times. It's almost impossible to build a distributed system that, that will do neither bad thing, um, just because of the laws of computing. Um, and like everything, Amazon performance is variable, so you may want to spin out a thread when you're putting things in the queue, and hopefully you don't care about performance when you're getting things. Um, but things to look out for. Next, please. So here's some, let's say we've got a service that will take a given image and Photoshop a cat into it automatically. So you create your queue, um, you can do all the normal queue management things, you can't create a queue after it's been deleted for a couple minutes because it may take minutes for it to propagate out to the whole system. Um, you know, you just, you can, like I said, it's only strings <coughs> you're queuing up. We cheat and just YAMLize everything because why wouldn't you do that? Um, and that makes it you know, pretty simple to work with without having to create some hideous string format that you're going to have to remember later. Um, and you're going to be fast, just throw something like that at it. And if you're hitting the limits of when this will actually start to come around and hurt you, then you already know that you're doing that and how to solve it. Next, please. Um, so to receive messages, there's this cool q.poll thing, um, which will poll every however many seconds you tell it to. Um, it's really nice. There's also this q.get, which works exactly the same way. Um, if you've got something else you're going to use to um, take that script and, and daemonize it, then you know these two are functionally equivalent. One of them does the stuff for you, the other one assumes that you're already doing all that loop stuff. Um, there are other ways to do it. You can call receive message directly, but this takes care of all the details. Um, it automatically locks that message for you, which happens with all the other methods too. Um, after five minutes, if you haven't finished your block, it will go and unlock the message so other processors can get it. Um, it, it really does a lot of the, the messy details of distributed queues, it manages automatically. If you go get your queue size, what you're gonna get back 
will have almost no relationship to your queue size. Like it'll be close. It will be a number that your queue size has been at some point in the past or future maybe. But because it's distributed, it will go find a server that has some portion of your queue and say, all right, how many objects do you think we have? <coughs> and it's not accurate, it's not precise, don't rely on it. You can enqueue a message and the queue size will remain zero for the next 30 seconds, 40 seconds sometimes. Um, you know, basically, like in our monitoring service, we look at queue size, and if it's under 500, we, that's zero to, to us, because anything up to that number, as messages go in and out, it, it's a little bit random. But if you're at the kind of scale where the things that SQS does become important, then zero and 500 really are almost the same number, so it doesn't matter that much. Now, if you're going to be receiving messages multiple times, here's my wall of text for the evening. Um, you need to make sure that everything that you do at the receiving end of a queue message is item potent. So if you apply whatever your function is more than once, it shouldn't damage the results. So this right here, which seems nice and simple, you're receiving a message and you're just incrementing a counter, that'll kill you because you'll get that multiple times. And you'll be incrementing the counter multiple times for the same event. Instead, and this works okay, um, you know, create something that has a unique identifier from that message, and then count the number of those things that you've created. A lot more data, a little messier, you'll have to go clean up after yourself later, but it prevents you from incrementing that counter more than once. Um, if you need to do a lot of work, and this is something that we are going to be doing real soon, you know, do some of your work, and then check to see if somebody else already did it and do a little more work and check to see if somebody else already did it. And then go ahead and apply cats to your image and then check to see if somebody else already did it and then write the output. As many times as you can check to see if you're the second person to get this message, it's good, it keeps you from doing work. But even with this, if you end up applying the same cats to the same image four or five times in a row, you should still end up with just exactly the same image because you're not writing to your input. You never want to modify one of your source objects unless you're respecting the fact that it has to be item potent. Next, please. Some more things. Um, key and token management, if you need to give somebody a temporary key, um, a session key to get into your AWS services, all the different kinds of keys you can possibly create, there's an API for that that makes sense, buried somewhere in the gym. Um, there's a new, the new user access management stuff that I looked at before is actually a new part of the gym. This is the old way. The new way is in some ways simpler and in some ways it has access to so many more features with those policy documents that it's also much more complicated in some situations. So I'm done. Um, it's a huge gem because it enables you to do absolutely everything that you can possibly do with AWS, pretty much. Um, I. If you have more questions about a specific part, we can talk about that. If there's some specific part you want me to go into more depth in, in the future, I will. Um, I just wanted to make sure that I touched on sort of all the different pieces that are there. And hopefully there's some piece there where something else you're using has been causing you pain, and maybe this gem and Amazon can help you out. Um, right now we're just using the SQS portion. We're probably going to look at moving over our S3 stuff. Uh, away from right AWS and to the AWS SDK soon and here's a picture I stole from next year so that's that's that questions <laughs> is any of the code in the the gem from other gems and use like the S3 gem or right AWS or is it all like the stuff? Uh, I don't know I know that this you know it's an official from Amazon gem and none of the others really are so it may or may not be original. I haven't, I haven't gotten into the code of write AWS or the S3 gem, honestly, so I wouldn't recognize it. It does seem, internally, the code is very self-consistent. It's all written in the same way, using the same sometimes painful classes. So I suspect not. I think based on the size of the gem, they've probably been working on this like since EC2 came out, and now they're finally finished. Anyone else?